Okay, so uh, on Wednesday we left off uh, and we talked about um, some root finding methods and I think the last uh, last thing we showed was this, the Newton, Newton Raphson method for finding roots, okay? And, uh, and so the way uh, the Newton Raphson method works uh, for finding roots is you start at some location, okay? X zero, and you find um, where it uh, um, where it is on the uh, the function f of x zero, and you take the uh, the tangent line at f of x zero, and you follow the tangent line down to the uh, x axis, okay? And where that tangent line inter intersects the x axis is going to be the location of your next point, okay? So we have. Um, the next point being x1 is the, or xn plus 1 is your current location minus the run of, you know, kind of this triangle formed by the tangent line. So you start off here, you go up, you take the tangent line down, this is going to be your next location. And if this is your uh, next location, then you start here, you go up, take the tangent line, follow that back down. Uh, and that becomes your next location, and so on and so forth, and eventually it should kind of converge to um, where, where the uh, where the root is, where the function crosses the uh, the x-axis. Okay, um, and uh, and you'll have an exercise in your homework um, asking you to kind of code this up and try it out. Um, today we'll take a look at uh, some more root finding methods. Okay. More root finding methods, and one of them is the secant method. Okay, so the secant method is kind of like it's similar to newton raphson except it does not require that we find the derivative. Okay, so newton raphson re requires us to find the tangent line, and that means we need to know the derivative of the function at every point. Okay, so. Um, Sorry, I just lost my pen. Okay, so this is similar to newton raphson but does not require derivatives. So, you know, we could be in a situation where the derivatives are unknown or um, they're just uh, a little bit um, difficult for, uh, for us to find. And so, um, so the, the way Newton, uh, the secant method is we draw secant lines rather than tangent lines, okay? Okay, so a secant line is basically you have two points on a curve and you just connect them with a straight line. Okay, and so the uh, the picture here, and uh, and forgive my um, my drawing because it's it's quite difficult to draw straight lines on this thing. Um, but the um, the idea here is uh, we need two starting locations. Okay, so we'll have a x0 and an x1. Okay, so I'm going to just go ahead and I'm going to call this x0 and I'll call this location x1. And we kind of follow, uh, we find f of x0 and we find f of x1. Okay, so here's x0 and, uh, and this location is going to be f of x0 and this location is going to be f of x1, all right? And so um, what we do is we draw a secant line that connects the points x1, um, or maybe I'll do x0, f of x0, to uh, x1, f of x1, okay? 
So uh, I guess I'll, I'll just make this a coordinate pair. X1, F of X1, and over here at this point is X0 and F of X0. Okay. And uh, so we draw a secant line that connects the points, and we continue that line to the x-axis. <coughs> So here I'll, this is the hard part, but we're going to start here and we're going to draw a straight line, draw a straight line through these things, and we're going to just continue this down to the, uh, the x-axis here. Okay, so this is, this is supposed to be a straight line that connects these locations on um, right here. Okay, so these are is x0, f of x0, and x1, f of x1, and we draw a straight line that connects that. And right here, where it crosses the x-axis, that will be our next location, okay? Continue the line to the x-axis, and where it crosses, our next location. And then we repeat. So on the next iteration, I have um, x2 and f of x2. And I'm going to draw a line that connects x1, f of x1, like that. OK, so again, this is a little bit tricky. But so I draw a draw a secant line that connects. So this was x1 and this is x2, and I draw a line that connects those two things. And this location here will be x3. And then you know I repeat that, and uh, and then I draw a line that kind of connects like this. And this will be x4 so on and so forth, okay? And that should get us closer and closer and closer to the root until we converge. Does that kind of make sense, the, uh, the idea here? So no derivatives are required. We just need to have kind of one starting two starting locations, x0 and x1. We find those locations on the, uh, the curve. We connect those with a straight line. We follow that straight line down to the x-axis. That gives us our next location. We follow that up. We, now we have two, uh, like we take our two most recent points, we connect those, so on and so forth, and this will hopefully get us to converge at, uh, at the location, that, um, the root that, that we're looking for. Okay, so let's talk about where is, how do we figure out x2, okay? So if we have, so we have x1, uh, or I'll start off with x0. So we have x0, and we have f of x0, and we have x1, and we have f of x1. Okay? How do we get x2? Okay, what is x2? So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to just copy this triangle here, this from x2 to x um, x1, x0, all of that. So I'm going to take a, so I'm going to just pretend I've got some, some kind of curve here. Okay. So here's x, oops. Here is x1, here is x2, I'm sorry, not x2, x0, and over here is x2. And I want to know where do we, how do we get x2? Okay, up here is uh, f of x1, and up here is f of x0. Okay, well, what I can do is I can just say, well, if we look at this triangle, just like in um, 
the newton raphson method, what do I have? I can say, if we're looking at this triangle, we can say um, x2 is going to be x1 minus the run of this triangle, right? And here's, uh, here's rise, and, and so I can say, um, so much like before, I could say x2 is going to equal x1 minus the run. So that, that was, that's kind of a similar idea from newton rapson except, um, uh, and we said uh, slope is equal to rise divided by run. They still, they still use that terminology when they talk about slope when teaching slope in element algebra, right? Rise over run for slope? OK. That was, that was what they called it back, back when I learned algebra, and I'm assuming that's what they still call it. OK. So slope is rise over run. And so we are going to do, um, we're going to say run is going to be rise divided by slope. All right, uh, what is our run equal? To, I mean, I'm sorry. What is our rise equal to in this in this triangle? F of x one, right? Because we're uh, here. This is the x-axis, so we're at zero. So if we talk about, you know, how high are we? This is the rise is f of x one minus zero. Our, our rise is just f of x one. Okay, so right now we have um, run is equal to uh, rise divided by slope. I'm going to go ahead and just call it rise times slope inverse. Okay, the uh, um, I forgot what it was called reciprocal of slope. Okay, so we got run is equal to rise times uh, the reciprocal of slope. So rise is f of x one. Okay, now what is our slope? This is the qu next question. How do we figure out our slope? Okay. Well, here um, these are all triangles, and they're all kind of similar triangles, right? So what I can do is I can kind of draw a line across to here, and if we take a look just at this triangle, we can figure out the the slope because these are similar triangles. So um, so I'm going to just use a different coloring here, and I'll have rise and run over here in red. And so the slope of the yellow triangle is going to equal basically the slope of the green triangle. And so the slope of this green triangle is going to be uh, the slope is equal to rise divided by run. What is the rise of this green triangle? It's going to be the difference between f of x0 and f of x1, right? It's going to be the difference between f of x0 minus f of x1, OK? And what's the run? x0 minus x1. Is that OK? So if I combine all of these things together, then we have um, then we can put it all together, all right? So we're going to say x2 is equal to x1 minus the run. The run is going to be rise times slope inverse, so, or slope reciprocal, OK? So the rise is going to be f of x1 times, and now I'm going to flip this run over rise. So it's going to be x0 minus x1 divided by f of x0 minus f of x1. Well, so, so there we have that, OK? Does that make sense, how we arrived at what x2's location is going to be? So uh, if we generalize this, to say x, the next iteration, xn plus 1, this is going to be xn minus f of xn times 
And uh, and just to stay consistent with the uh, the books notation, I'm going to do um, x n minus x n minus one, and f of x n minus f of x n minus one. Okay. So whether I did x zero minus x one divided by f of x zero minus f of x one, or if I swapped those around and I did x one minus x zero divided by f of x one minus f of x zero, like it would be the same, right? So if I if I swap if I swapped these two positions, the x0 and x1s on the numerator, if I swap those two around and I swap the, um, these positions around also, as long as I'm consistent, our answer is not going to change. Okay? And so this becomes secant method. Or root finding. And again, does not require us to find derivatives. Just we just need the uh, the values of our, fun uh, our of the function at uh, at two locations in the beginning, and then um, and we and we trace that out. Okay. And I think I've got um, I have you guys code this up in your homework assignment. Okay, and you'll and you'll draw pictures to kind of. See how these graphs, graphs work. Okay. Questions? We're good? Okay. Um, all of these uh, methods, you know, we talked about in um, Newton Rapson, we said there's a possibility that Newton Rapson will not work, right? When, um, so Newton Rapson requires that we be able to differentiate the function. And so if we have a point, where there's a kind of a, a sharp angle or something, if it's not smooth, then the derivative doesn't exist. And, um, and that, that, that would be a problem. Or if you end up just by chance hitting um, a local min or local max or saddle point, then uh, the, the derivative is going to be 0, and newton raphson will fail, and things like that. And um, So not all of these methods are guaranteed to work. Um, but there is one method, and we call this uh, the bisection method. So the, uh, the bisection method, this is guaranteed to work for um, uh, a continuous function f of x. So as long as As long as f of x itself is continuous, the bisection method will work. Okay? So if you've got a discontinuity, then it breaks. But if it's continuous, it will work. And, um, and the way it works is um, we start with two endpoints. Okay, and I'm going to call this um, XL for X. Uh, so I'll say um, on the left, we've got XL1. And on the right, we'll have XR1 at, at time 1. Okay, And uh, we require F of X L1 to have the opposite sign of f of x r1, OK? And if they have opposite signs, then we know there has to be at least one root in between the left and the right boundary, OK? That's just the rule of math and functions, right? So um, we, require, we require these to have uh, opposite signs. Um, and if they ha have opposite signs, then we know there is at least one root. One root of f of x between xl1 and xr1. OK. Um, and so let's say, here's my x-axis. 
this is going to be our function here. And I'll say this is xl1, and over here is xr1. Okay, so xl1 will be right here. XR1 is right there. We've got different signs, and so, and we know there has, there's got to be at least one root between our two endpoints. Okay, so uh, the way the algorithm works is okay. So start with your boundaries XL1 and XR1. Okay, your left and right boundaries. Okay, and you find the midpoint. So this is going to be xm1 is equal to xl1 plus xr1 divided by 2. Okay, So we go uh, halfway between xl1 and xr1. Okay, And so I'll call this um, xm1. And, uh, and we find f of xm1. Okay, Find the sign. of f of x m1 and then you will keep either uh, you will keep two of these points you'll keep uh, the two that have opposite signs okay so you'll keep so I'll say keep x m1 and either x l1 or x r1 okay pick the one with the opposite sign Pick the one with the sign opposite of f of x of one m one. Okay. Right. So if x m one is negative, then we will keep x r one. Right. And then we repeat. Okay. So then once we've uh, picked this. Then for our next iteration, okay, xm1 becomes xl2, and xr1 becomes xr2. Okay, so we uh, and then uh, we'll find a new midpoint right here, and we'll call this xm2. xm2 is right here. And so uh, xm2 will become xr3. We're going to keep, uh, we'll keep xm2, and xl2 becomes xl3. Okay, so we'll, we'll keep xl2. That will stay for the next iteration, and then um, we keep going. We find the midpoint here. We have this. Okay, so this is. Uh, xm3, and this will become our left point. We're going to keep this one. This will become xl4, and xr3 becomes xr4 for the fourth iteration. Okay, and so on and so forth. And and you keep just dividing this in half, and half, and uh, and half, and so on and so forth. And you're going to eventually converge in. Uh, keep going. until basically xl at time n minus xr at time n is less than some tolerance, you know, chosen tolerance level. So you'll just keep going until the difference between xl and xr is, uh, is smaller than what you need it to be, okay? It's until it's small enough that you're, you're satisfied. And so this is uh, this is guaranteed to converge on a root, no matter what the function looks like. Okay, um, the reason why we might prefer newton raphson or some of the other methods over this is that those tend to converge fast quicker. Okay, so those you might get um, um, to your uh, root very quickly, and this one it reduces the. Uh, Kind of the the interval in half every time, which is pretty good. But some of the other methods, you know, they'll they'll cut out like ninety percent in a, in a single um, uh, single iteration. And so so this one's generally a little bit slower than the other ones, but uh, you know, it's pretty good. It's guaranteed to work.
So, so that's what we have for uh, the bisection method. Does it, does this kind of make sense? What's happening here? Bisection method. Okay. Um, so, um, so that that's it for root finding methods. And so now that we've covered root finding methods, we can start talking optimization methods. Okay. So um, optimization methods, um, we'll start off with unidimensional ones, OK? So we'll start with unidimensional optimization. OK, and the idea here is you've got a function of one variable, so the unidimensional part. And, uh, and we are searching for a local min or local max. Okay, that's what, that's what we're searching for. Okay, so that's going to be a unidimensional optimization. Um, we're going to search for a local minimum or local maximum. And, uh, and what we'll see is that um, these are just numeric methods. We're kind of going to just kind of build on um, all of these root finding methods that we just talked about. Okay, so on Wednesday we talked about root finding methods, fixed point iteration, Newton Raphson. Today we talked about secant method and bisection things and whatever. Okay, we've got um, optimization methods, um, and they're going to kind of build on that. And uh, and optimization is uh, is very useful. Okay, I mean root finding is useful, but generally um, a lot of our problems can be, in statistics, can be framed as optimization problems, okay? So let me just kind of cover a few applications, a few important statistical applications of optimization. Okay, and um, we're going to just spend a very brief time on kind of these optimization methods. Um, we cover optimization methods uh, in a lot more depth in 102B. Okay, because I mean the the I think the course of the course is called optimization and computation, or computation and optimization, or something. So so it's a, it's a much bigger topic, but uh, you know as far as um, this class, Introduction to Computational Statistics, will we'll cover just some of the, a couple of these basic methods here. All right. So we have a few important statistical applications of optimization. All right. So if you think about, um, so anytime you see the words maximum or the words least or smallest or something, then then it's probably an indicator of an optimization thing, right? So if we think of linear regression and we have ordinary, I don't know why I can't. All right, so we have ordinary least squares regression. OLS regression. Um, basically, we search for the parameters, search for the parameter estimates. Um, B0 and B1 and yi equal to uh, B0 plus B1 xi plus e sub i, okay? Um, such that what, how do we choose the parameters B0 and B1 for ordinary least squares regression? How do we know that these are the best ones to use? So you, you create it, you type, you're in 101A, right? Or you've taken 101A? You should be. Okay. Um, so in R, right, you type in LM and you say, like, Y tilde X data equals this, right? Uh, and it comes back and it says, intercept is this, slope is this, right? 
How do we know that these are the best values to use? What what is it what property? Yeah, it's so that um, the sum of the squared residuals is minimized, right? So if you have uh, y hat sub i is equal to b0 plus b1 x sub i, then um, we minimize the sum of each individual value minus its predicted value across all possible, across all observations in our data, right? And if we, if you, I don't know if you guys played around with it, but if you picked any other value of b0 or b1, you're not going to minimize this sum of squares residual, okay? You know, b0 and b1 hat, or uh, I guess, no, it's just b0 and b1, uh, minimize the sum of squared error, okay? All other values will produce a larger um, SS error, okay? Okay, now, did you guys have to derive those values? No? Maybe in 100B, did you derive them? Okay, nobody has to do any work anymore. Um, uh, well, anyway, basically, we've, we've solved this. We've solved this uh, with calculus, all right? And we said, okay, well, using calculus and what we understand about calculus, we can say that um, this value of b1 is going to minimize it, and this value of b0 is going to minimize it, right? And you see it said b1 ends up being like the correlation times the standard deviation of y over the standard deviation of x, and b0 ends up being y bar minus the slope times x bar and things like that. Those, um, that's been solved via calculus, but it's still an optimization problem. And um, maybe uh, next quarter, if you're in 102b, we will come across... Um, you know, slight modifications of this function here, which we might call a loss function. This is this is how we measure when we look at the sum of squares error, and we say y i minus y i hat. Um, we're we're basically saying how good is my model? Okay, how well does it fit the data? If y i hat, my predicted value, is very close to y i, this value is going to be small. And that's a good thing, right? But if I predict something up here and the true value is down here, then uh, yi minus yi hat is going to be a big value. We're going to get a big residual squared, and and then we get a big, uh, you know, it's a problem here, right? So, um, but you know, we can have other modifications. We can modify um, basically how we measure how good or bad our model is. We, we can modify that, and now we have a different optimization problem. We now have another thing that we want to say. We want to, we want to minimize how bad our model is, but we've changed the rules for how to, what determines what a bad model is. Okay, so right now in ordinary least squares regression, um, the badness of our model is determined by the squared residual, right? Um, do you guys learn weighted least squares regression in 101A? Okay, what does weighted least squares regression do? Okay, um, what, so what weighted least squares regression does is it place, places weights on certain observations. And it says this observation is like really important. And so if this observation has um, a big residual, because it's so important, we're going to blow it up. We're going to multiply it by 10, okay? And so if, uh, so uh, when you have weighted least squares regression, you're going to say these observations are important, so I got to make sure that my line comes in very close to these important observations. These other observations out here, I don't really care about them. They're not as important. 
and and we're still minimizing the total whatever function we've used to say how good or bad our model is and in weighted least squares regression we're saying these observations are more important we've got to make sure that the line fits really close to them and anything uh, and these other observations with that we gave little weights to they're not important we don't care your residuals huge boohoos um, but these ones these are our VIP observations we want to make sure their residuals are as small as possible right that's weighted least squares regression and you got all sorts of other versions of least squares or this and that um, they're all optimization functions they're all um, you've got some kind of thing in in this case um, we have two values, b0 and b1, that we're trying to minimize. Um, and, uh, and so this is an optimization problem, right? So um, this is not unidimensional because um, b0 and b1 um, uh, are both used to calculate the uh, SS error, okay? And so, you know, this is a, a function of two va variables. All right, um, so that's least squares regression. That's, that's an important thing that we're trying to minimize. Um, what else do we have? We have um, maximum likelihood estimation, all right? This is also an optimization problem. So what's maximum likelihood estimation? So this should have been covered in, what, 100B? You guys are in that now? Or you took that already? All right, so what's maximum likelihood estimation? You guys are breaking my heart. Um, <laughs> I hope your other professors don't see this. Okay. Um, all right, so in maximum likelihood estimation, what are we trying to do? We are saying um, we believe our data comes from this probability distribution, right? We're going to say, like, maybe our data, um, you know, our x comes from, x comes from a normal distribution, all right? Uh, the only problem is, uh, and, and we want to say, like, all right, so we've observed these values x. They've come from a normal distribution. And I want to know what is the mean of the population, right? x comes from a normal distribution. We want an estimate of the mean of the population, mean of this um, normal distribution. OK. Uh, we'll pretend that we already know sigma, all right? Okay, and so let's say x comes in, and uh, and you see like values like 100, 120, um, 105, 90, 80, okay, stuff like that, all right? And we say, all right, based on these values, what do we think that the mean of the population is? And uh, the value word that we're going to use is going to be the value that maximizes the likelihood or the probability of seeing the data that I have, right? So, so we will choose uh, an estimate of mu that maximizes the probability, or in this case, the likelihood of the data that we have observed. Okay, so, so if somebody says, oh, I think the mean of the population, I heard it was like 150, right? And you look at these numbers, you go, I don't know, that doesn't make sense. The mean being 150 in the population, how did I get an 80, right? How did I get, why are all of my numbers like way smaller than 150? Your estimate of 150 doesn't make sense, right? Okay, so uh, somebody else goes, oh, yeah, 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 no, 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 that was something else. Um, the mean of the population is like uh, 90, okay? And you go, uh, 
well, I guess that's that's a little bit more reasonable, okay? Um, and you can say, well, yeah, if the mean of the population is 90, then, then that makes sense because I got 90 and 80 and 100. But I also somehow got 120. And so maybe 120, that, that doesn't quite make sense. And then so, so basically, you'd have to look at all of these different things. Um, and it, it turns out that probably the mean of the population is going to be something like 99 or 100, OK? Because 99 is going to be the value that maximizes the probability of getting all of the data that I've observed, right? So the likelihood function, our uh, likelihood function, is going to be, uh, you know, assuming the likelihood is equal to the product of probabilities. Um, you know, assuming each observation is independent. So the likelihood is going to be, you know, the probability of x being 100, and we multiply that by the probability that x is going to be 120, times the probability that x is going to be 105, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this just becomes the product of x being each observation given, you know, our value mu and sigma and things like that uh, for things like this, you know, across all, across all i's, OK? Um, and if we wanted to maximize this using calculus, what would we do? We would have to take the derivative and whatever, right? But then we said taking the derivative of a product is pretty challenging, right? So what do you have to do? So we do a trick, right? We say, well, derivatives of products, that's hard. Let's take the log, OK? And that turns products into sums. And we say, oh, well. The derivative of a sum is, uh, is easy. And because the log is this monotonic function, if a value maximizes the log, it, that same value will maximize the original function, which is, which is a nice thing. So, so we often do that. OK. So anyway, let's get back to unibit dimensional optimization. Right? So in calculus, to solve for a local min or local max, what we do is we take the derivative of our function and set it equal to 0 and solve. Set it equal to 0, solve. OK? We. Um, We'll basically do the same thing. Okay. We have root finding methods that is able to solve where a function equals zero. Okay. Okay, so to optimize a function, all we do is we um, take the derivative and use a root finding method. Okay, to optimize a function, we take the derivative and use a root finding method on the derivative. Okay. Of course, this means we have to be able to take the derivative of a function, right? So, so maybe we will run into some problems, but we've got some workarounds uh, that that I can talk about on Monday and stuff. Okay. So we take the derivative, use the uh, and use a root finding method on the derivative. Okay. So this um, assumes we can take the derivative. Okay. Maybe not always possible. Um, okay, so let me just do a quick, quick example.
Okay, so we'll do uh, Newton Rapson for optimization. Okay, so we'll say, um, so just recall Newton Rapson for root finding looks like this. Um, root finding of f of x will be xn plus 1 is equal to xn minus f of xn divided by f prime of xn. So this is what we're going to do. Okay, newton Rapson for optimization. All right, so let's say we have some function g of x that we want to optimize. What we will do is we take the derivative of g of x, and we will let f of x be the derivative. Okay, so we um, we take the derivative of g of x. Okay, so uh, let f of x equal the derivative g prime of x, okay? And now, basically, we apply our root finding method to f of x. The roots of f of x will be the critical points of g of x, okay? Roots of f of x will equal critical points Of g of x. Okay, so for Newton Rapson, all this means is we say, well, xn plus 1 is going to equal xn minus f of xn divided by f prime of xn. Okay, this will give us will give us the roots of f of x, which are critical points of g of x, okay? And then f of x is equal to g, of g prime of x, and f prime of x is going to be equal to g double prime of x. Mm -hmm. So we can just use those directly, and we can say, well, xn plus 1 is equal to xn minus uh, g prime of xn divided by g double prime of xn, okay? And this is this will locate the critical points will locate the critical points of g of x okay uh, this assumes you know g of x is twice differentiable so uh, g of x needs to be twice differentiable which means, you know, maybe it doesn't work for all functions, but a lot of them, it will work, okay? Uh, and we'll be able to find mins and maxes this way by using, um, by basically taking the root finding method and just applying it to the derivative of a function. And we've turned a root finding method now into an optimization method. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll stop there for today. Have a good weekend, you guys. We'll see you, uh, see you next week.